Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and we are here today for part two of the Alex Van Halen Gear Series with Kurt Ekstrom. Kurt, welcome back. Hello. Thanks again for having me. Yes. I uh, appreciate you giving me so much time and, and being so thorough. Uh, part one was incredible. Um, since we recorded, I have now had my third and final child. So I have a newborn baby here. So it's thank you very much, which is insane. Uh, and we're doing this at 8 a.m. because <laughs> there it's uh, with three kids. I'm working on uh, everyone's schedule. And um, you were kind enough to do it this early with me, which I really appreciate. The cool thing you said I, I liked was when you said the band is now complete. <laughs> that, that was awesome. Is complete. Yeah. <laughs> Unless, you know, so we got two drummers, then we'll have to figure something out. But mm. but yeah, we are. We're done. <laughs> I can't I can't handle anymore. Um, they're too close. They're, they're close together. So they'll be friends as they grow up and things like that. But, uh, this is going to be a long one. We, uh, we stopped last time on, uh, around 1985, 1986. Kurt, let's jump in, man. So where do we pick up, uh, with the ending of part one now on part two in the mid eighties? So we kind of split, um, where it's sort of a debate as to whether David Lee Roth left the band or was fired or, I mean, it's, it's really, it's an evolutionary thing, where, but they just sort of parted ways, and there was a brief period where they just the band, Edward, Alex, and Michael, did not know what they wanted to do, and in you know came the fate with Sammy Hagar, and you know to quickly gloss through that, he um they they uh, Edward's uh, Lamborghini mechanic hooked him up with Sammy Hagar, who had a Ferrari in the shop, and so Sammy came over to jam and to see how things would go, and they actually discovered it was a you know, they had some magic there, so they immediately, you know, brought him into the band and started working on ideas because uh, Edward had already had some ideas that he was planning to use for the potentially next album with Dave that never materialized. And so Sammy apparently came into the studio and right off the bat was banging off melodies and lyrics and everybody was blown away. So they started to work on what became 5150. So the studio, as we talked about earlier, um, Edward had built the 5150 studio, and they recorded 1984 there. Well, um, uh, so they, they recorded 5150 as well there, and they obviously, they used Don Landy again. And um, Alex this time, for whereas in, in 1984, he was playing uh, half Simmons, and he had um, Roto Toms and all that. I guess he decided at this time he wanted to go full Simmons, uh, except for the snare. And so the entire kit was mostly focused around the Simmons pads and, and you know, the, the Thomas snare again. And so one of the things that we, I think we talked about it before, and and uh, and it seems, you know, a little odd to me, but Edward has claimed that they used the Simmons because they were worried about, you know, there was too much bleed from all the other instruments to have all those mics. And I'm sure that was partly true, but at the same time, I think, Alex was just really into a Simmons phase and he wanted to do it personally. I actually saw a comment from him later on where apparently when the album came out, he was kind of really not happy with the way the drum sounded just because of, I don't know, I guess he just didn't like it. But um, he actually got a comment from, uh, it was like Jim Keltner or somebody like that. I can't remember exactly who it was, but they gave him this compliment telling him how much they liked the album and how creative it was to use the Simmons. And so it, you know, I guess it made him feel better about it. But I don't really have any photos except this one photo where I know that Edward used to do a lot of demos and recording and stuff. So uh, this, I've got this photo here. You can see in the photo that like there's a red SDSV kit in the background. Um, uh, you know, you get the china up there. You got um, this. The other bass drum is sort of tucked in behind. I guess the uh, you know the baffle behind there. Yeah. But, um, Which there's a China there. You're thinking like, okay, I thought you guys were trying to eliminate bleed. Well, that's that's what the I, China's as bleedy as it gets. You know? it, yeah, it, the whole thing is a is a little confusing to me. And the other thing that is confusing to me is that I know he had the regular Tama snare, but when you look at this picture, that's clearly a maple snare in the background or a maple finished. So I don't know if it was another Tama that he had. I've never heard anything about this i don't i, I just don't know um but you can see a wooden looks like a maple snare on this kit that's in in the background and so i'm gonna a guess because the picture you know if i blew it up you can't really see much i'm gonna guess that it's a uh another tama 
Um, or, yeah. you know, this photo, I think Eddie actually did a uh, soundtrack for a movie called The Wildlife, where he played pretty much all the instruments on everything. And it was just little pieces and snippets. And I think he did this in between like 1984 and the 5150 album. So it's likely that that may be set up like, like there's a version of what eventually became good enough where Eddie played all the instruments on it. Like basically there's a drum machine going, but he put Phil's in there from the Simmons kit. And mm, yeah. you know, I mean, who knows? Maybe this was a setup that Eddie was using. There's I'll tell people there's a um, episode all about the history of Simmons, which is kind of a which is kind of a cool one to, to learn about this and how they were made. And the it's an English brand and all that stuff. But it was the thing to use. I mean, it was, well, it was just so popular. The other thing that's kind of cool to note is like I actually um, and of course, you know him, uh, John to Christopher. We've talked about him before, and uh, he actually yeah. worked for Simmons in the 80s, and I was talking to him at one point, and I think he said he was working there when they sent over you know, some stuff up to 5150 for Alex, but, um, so that's kind of nice. cool. And um, So they worked on the album, completed the album. When he, Alex went to go on tour, he decided um, he wanted a kit that was probably similar to like the 1984 kit, but this time he ended up using um, uh, Vistalite shells again. Which is another thing I'd be curious to know, like where he got them from, because as we mentioned in the earlier episode, when he had the 1981 Fair Warning Kit, well, Ludwig discontinued Vistalite shells around 81 or so. And so um, sure. by yeah. 1986, Vistalite shells, they just, you know, they weren't making them anymore, or at least Ludwig wasn't. And so he got this kit, and uh, you can see like a side view of it here, and um He's got his rosewood snare and all that, but he outlined it with um, the Simmons pads once again. He's got octa bands in the front, and he's got like Peisty 2002s around the kit. The other thing he did, and you can see in this photo, and he really just, he never used them, was um, he's got like Vistalite floor toms tucked underneath the Simmons floor toms. So, and he never used them, you said. And he never used them. Like, they were there, I think, just, like, much like we were talking about the 1984 kit. Yeah, I mean, especially for Alex Van Halen in an arena where you're used to this giant, like, masterpiece of a drum set that has, like, all these things coming off of it to just go to, like, a little tiny Simmons kit where there's no depth to them. You just right. see right through them. You need a little more to it. So so this is a, so again, to explain for people on, on listen just to the podcast, the audio, this is a full acrylic clear kit, the bass yep. drums, and it's got red hoses coming yeah, off, which so are connecting to his whatever auxiliary bass drums. Uh, is that again, the same kind of resonance technique where he's running? Those are the tubes that connect the two. They're actually I, functioning. I, I, I would say no Maybe. because he was triggering Simmons bass drums. Oh. I, I think I just I just think it was a lot of stuff was for the show. A lot of the stuff was for, for a look, um, and you know I really don't think those outside bass drums really did anything. They have a mic on them. It looks like there's a mic, but it could be just for the show again. It's, like, it's possible. I mean, I, I, I you have a good point. Like they do have a mic on them, so. It's possible that they tried to combine maybe the the sound of the Simmons and then sort of mix in some acoustic bass drum, but it would seem to me, just from guessing, um, a Vistalite shell that was you know basically like resonating without any like muffling or anything inside would almost seem like it would be more of a hindrance to you know like a yeah. sound guy than than anything, yeah. especially when the sound of the Simmons is a lot more direct and it's you know it's I don't know it's hard to say because uh, yeah. And, and then again, you can see the massive boom stance he's using with the holding the cymbals up. So those bass drums are, um, what do we have there? Um, they're like 28 by 26. And wow. and then like 28 by 24. And then, they, of course, they got the radial horns inside. With the uh, Vistalite bass drum, I think this was like one giant piece of acrylic. As far as I can oh. tell, it wasn't like he took you know, two existing bass drums and joined them together. So I'm yeah. guessing that he must have found a plastics company or something to uh, to assemble this kit somehow. It's a very odd kit for the most part. And uh, this is kind of a, you know interesting story because I mentioned in the last episode how I um, really wanted to see that 1984 tour and it didn't work out. But this time around when they came, I was 15 and I had a friend 
whose mother was going to take a bunch of, you know, bunch of us to go. And so I ended up getting my brother, who was like, we're a year and 14 days apart. We ended up going with uh, these friends. And, uh, and of course, you know, I was, it was my first major concert. Like I could, I mentioned before, Buddy Rich was the first thing I'd ever seen, but it was at yeah. a high, it was at a high school, and so this, this was is Van Halen in, in an arena, in an arena, and it was my first yeah. time. And the interesting thing to note, because I was so clueless at fifteen, that like I just kept thinking to myself, like I wonder where Alex is set. Is is it going to rise up from under the stage? I couldn't, I just couldn't tell. And the opening act that year was Bob Bachman Turner Overdrive. Apparently, Randy Bachman was a friend of Sammy Hagar's, and. So they they went on a sort of a nostalgic tour for 1986. So they had a bunch of hits, and and, yeah. and of course, you know, as good as I actually thought they were, I mean, I just couldn't wait for them to get off the stage because I was, you know, I wanted to see Van Halen. But yeah, their drummer was, I believe, was Gary Patterson, and I think he was also in the Guess Who, and well, he was playing cool. this little Yamaha kit. It was like a four piece kit. I'll never forget. And uh, you know, he was perfect for what he was doing and all that. But uh. But I just kept on wondering where Alex's set would be. And behind Gary, there was this big sheet covering what I thought I figured was like amps and stuff. And so when they finally moved Gary's kid out of the way and they pulled that sheet off, I almost like fell over because I was like, that's Alex's <laughs> drum set. Like it was <laughs> 10 times the size of the one that's that Gary awesome. was playing. I was like, oh, my God. And so yeah. I, I just couldn't believe how big it was. But they had just yeah. had it covered with a sheet. And it just didn't dawn on me that that that, that could be the set. And the other yeah. thing that, that really got me, because I know a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I hated the way those Simmons drums sounded or this or that. Or, But um, when I saw it in person, in concert, those things just, they, they it's almost like somebody like punched me in the chest and then like, you know, kicked me in the face and just left me in the street for, like, they just, <laughs> they, they rattled, they were low, they were thunderous. They were coming, so you liked them live. It's coming through a PA. They sounded incredible. Like I just, That's awesome. I just the minute he did a roundhouse fill around that thing, I was just like, oh my god, like wow. <laughs> That's cool. And so it it just it's planted the seed for me to say, you know, I need to get a like a set of Simmons drums. And of course, being fifteen and not having one idea like what what that would entail. And so, yeah. um, you know, this was the kid, and he used it throughout this tour. And uh, let's see if I can get some more pictures of it. And it was, you know, it was pretty massive. Um, yeah, it's a nice, it's a huge kit. Four, three or four bass drums. Four here. bass drums. Four bass drums, like usual. Yeah. So he kind of has his aesthetic. Like, yes, it's changed, but it's got the octobons in the front, the four, uh, four bass drums. Now there's a row of Simmons behind it, but he's got the the gong he's got the connecting tubes he's got the kind of yeah uh the the horns in the bass drums so he's really got his the kit looks similar like he has like the blueprint of it yeah the drums have just changed and it really honestly it's it's pretty much like looking at the 84 tour set minus you know except they're just all clear like the yeah. the sizes are similar and 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 of course he's got as i said a couple of floor toms i think they're I think they're both 18 inch floor toms that he just mm. tucked underneath the pads. Here's another shot. And you can see um, the snare drum too. It's that same Thomas snare drum. You can see again, once again, his hi hats all the way up. Um, you can see that um, he's using the giant sticks again, but he's got like tape over the entire snare. Like the entire head is covered in tape. That's the muffling. That's yeah. just, that's how he's doing it's, it. Yeah. yeah, but he, I mean, but it's the funny thing to note is like, as we're going along and like, he just did different tape techniques and sometimes no tape and it still always sounded like Alex, you know what I mean? No, no matter what he did to that snare, he just always sounded like him. Yeah. And I actually saw a comment from Sammy Hagar once where he said that during this tour, there was one point when he just, you know, walked over to the kit during sound check and hit the snare drum once. And he said it was the loudest thing he ever heard in his life. Like it just, <laughs> he was like, I don't know how that guy sits back there. Like I just, you, you destroyed. And, uh, and, uh, and I don't know, think he was wearing any ear protection in those days. You know, they had, um, the, you know, they had monitors off to the side yeah. of him that were like cranking Eddie and stuff. And you can also see, it looks like he's wearing like knee pads and, a, you know, he wears like, you know, Maybe not the football pants necessarily, but like <laughs> like jogger pants or whatever. You know the stuff I yeah. mope around the house on a Saturday with. You know, like uh, you know that was a thing though, where even like um, 
Lars Ulrich would be wearing like like stretchy tight yeah. pants or like Simon Phillips with his like Tama brand like you know yeah they're like spandex and, I mean yeah and this is you know for all warts and all this was 1986 I mean oh, I was there I lived it people wore spandex pants and and yeah. uh and it, but you know so so it was pretty cool and then and he had the um you know the SDSV brain off to the side so um. One thing. Do you have you heard any like horror stories of things like it crashes or doesn't work live or anything like that? Or I is mean, it, I haven't. I I yeah. I didn't hear anything like that. And that would be interesting to know, like how many. Like I'd be curious to know using a baseball bat sized stick. Like like did he have twenty five pads like on tour with him and they just swap them out? I mean, yeah, really. Simmons are you know it's really kind of funny because. You, you you know it's not like a drum where like you, you only hit a Simmons pad so hard and that's it's it that's it you know like there's no velocity there's, yeah basically. there's a little bit you know from the uh the yeah, way yeah, you yeah. can but I mean it's not like a real drum and like and when you hit that drum at full volume like that's it and so like you know and, and they also they claim that the original um you know the Simmons SDSV pads were like tabletops so I mean using a a ball bat sure. stick on a tabletop with no rebound and that was the whole that's the big complaint but it's neat to again go back to when i did the simmons episode where they were like i mean these guys were heck spray painting you know painting yep. the body of these pa these pads and like the attic of this building and then carrying them down the fire escape and then it ends up in like you know california with uh, uh, in an arena with van halen it's like yep. it's a cool story simmons yeah this week's episode is proudly sponsored by gm designs custom symbols GM Designs is far from your average symbol company, as they specialize in creating one-of-a-kind symbols that are truly unique. Their extensive product catalog features over 100 symbols, and they were recently featured in a very cool R. David R. YouTube video that had a glowing review of GM Designs symbols. Their expertise goes beyond crafting original symbols. They also revive forgotten concepts, breathing new life into them for enthusiasts to rediscover. Within the last six months, GM Designs has achieved more remarkable milestones, including they currently produce the largest clap stack on the market at 16 inches, 18 inches, and 20 inches. They created Neptune, the thinnest crash ride symbol available on the market. The Nebula, a raw blank that's been expertly hand hammered, lathed, but left untrimmed, delivering the deepest, most soulful tone in a ride symbol. And they recently released the Odyssey Flat Ride, which is a very unique GM Designs take on the classic jazz flat ride. Whether you're a studio musician, a touring professional, or an enthusiastic beginner, GM Designs Custom Symbols has something for you. Explore their gallery of products, find store links, and discover their latest features at gmdsymbols.com. Don't miss out on the incredible craftsmanship and innovation at gmdsymbols.com. Yeah, and you can see kind of in this shot here, like the bass drums from the side, how long they were. You know, they're like barrel-like bass drums. It just... Yeah. Uh, it's, it was, I mean, and I, and I will say, you know, seeing it live, it was, it was a really cool-looking kit. You know, the Vista light was actually a cool choice. You know, you could see them a little bit more. And and it was just, it was an interesting choice just for aesthetic, I guess. Is he basically on a one, a new kit every year at this point? Every year-ish? I would say to every degree. He's uh, he's on okay. a new kit every, basically every year. Uh, okay, wow. He never, every, every single tour, there was something different. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Why not? I mean, <laughs> yeah. And, and again, we talked about this in the, in the, I mean, I think it was probably more so emphasized in the David Lee Roth years, but um, it was all about the show. You know, like everything was all about making the show bigger and better. Whereas, I mean, I feel like it when the Sammy Hagar years, not to uh, rag on Dave in any way, shape or form, but he was more of a entertainer or he was more of like a people call him like a ringleader and all that and yeah. uh whereas in sammy hagar was a technically proficient better singer he was also a guitar player which freed up you know eddie to go play some keys and uh sure. and, and in that first tour like eddie did actually play keys for you know while sammy did some of those the guitar solos on songs like love walks in and um why can't this be love and so you know it was kind of neat to see them sort of move around i know eddie, a lot of people like to say they like to see eddie the guitar hero but it was nice to see him you know switch instruments yeah. and and it's a uh, show and so you know they alex of course still tried to cater to the show with his drums and all that but um 
But, it, you know, you'll see as the years move on, like I think, you know, a bigger emphasis might have been put on musicality versus, you know, craziness as far as, the, you know, the, the show goes. But, they you know, they use some pyrotechnics, things like that. There was no um, fire extinguisher, no, you know, no flames. I didn't never got to see that. Um, but you can see in this next photo, you know, it's like somebody captured the shot right when the, you know. You know That's the, awesome. Yeah. So the top of the gong has, you know, like the sparks going off. And of course, you know, you'd see it as they ended a song and. More firework kind of sparks coming off of it as opposed to, because I mean, honestly, fire melts plastic. Yeah. So probably would have melted the kid if you had oh, night after night after night um, flames engulfing yep. the kit. Yep. And, um. You know, for a 15-year-old, it was, you know, it's obviously a pretty cool way to end songs. Yeah. And, and you can see over to Alex's um left, that big, huge box next to his, like, you know, before the gong and in between him and the gong, that's the the SDSV brains. So he had the brains over there. Although, I mean, I think likely he set the parameters and it was like a set it and forget it kind of deal. But those things are weird because, like, you got to remember, like, like Prince used those things on, um you know, Purple Rain. And so some of the sounds that Prince got are nothing like the sounds that Alex got. Alex went for more of a, a traditional sort of a Simmons Tommy sound. Whereas then like if you listen to a song like um When Doves Cry or what I mean, there's some really weird Simmons noises going on. And so it really only takes a couple of tweaks of the brain to sort of rearrange that sound. So if somebody yeah. went along, you know, like if somebody's five year old went up there and said, Hey, and twisted <laughs> all the knobs like it would You'd probably, be, yeah, take a while to get those sounds back. Yeah, or I'm sure you know there's probably wax pencil or whatever white little marks that say where where to where to have it. But but yeah, you'd be, it's tough. And, but, and it's and it's the, yeah. the fun thing to note when I'm talking about that as well is like one of the parameters that you can adjust on there is the amount of decay. And so I feel like like if you watch the video they have, uh, which you know is the perfect video to see any of this is um, live without a net which was actually filmed two weeks after the show I saw. So, I mean, it was super close. And so yeah. I love watching Live Without a Net. I've seen it a thousand times and because uh, it's just, you know, reminds it's literally like watching the show um, just two weeks later. And um, But the sound of the Simmons on that, there's a little bit more decay to them. And when they recorded the album, it almost seems like they rolled off that decay. So the Simmons have more of a, I don't know if you want to call it a dead sound. But I pref yeah. preferred the way he had them tuned, or I guess, you know, the knobs moved. I, I preferred the way he did it in a live setting versus the way it sounded on the on the record. It sounds a little bit a little bit sort of dead to me on, on the record. Um, it's still interesting, but it just, they're a little more lively sounding. Um, the other thing, let's see. So here's another cool shot of like a, a full-on... You just kind of see how big this thing is, you know. Oh man, it's just like huge. The the tubes and everything look awesome. I mean, it's, yeah. And then the let me see. Here's another shot of you know him at the end of a whatever, and you know, it's like the big gong. It's just it's really cool. Open the nice riser. He's got a bunch of symbols. So the other thing to note, and this is uh, the the last picture I have of the uh, fifty one fifty kit, is that Sammy Hagar did a video. He made a solo album in between 50 and 50 and the next Van Halen record because he had an obligation with his former record company. So they, they made a video for a particular song. I think it was Hands and Knees, but um, but they included some of the Van Halen guys in it. And there's actually a shot of Alex where, like, they're trying, you know, Sammy's basically trying to get the band to jam, and they're all, all the guys are busy, and they show a clip mm. of Alex jamming away on his kit, but he's playing the 5150 kit, but there's no Simmons pads. So it's almost like the whole kit is made up of Vistalite drums, which is kind oh, of weird. Cool. So I have this one yeah. shot you can kind of see, and you can't really see the toms because he's blocking them, but that is the kit. And I mean, it looks like he's in a death cage match. Like, I don't even know where this thing was, <laughs> photo was taken. Yeah, it's, it's again, for to describe, it's it's a chain link, not even fence. It's like almost like, it's like a like a UFC looking kind of yeah. like uh, octagon type deal, but it's, it's pretty tough looking, but there's no Simmons pads at all to, to the kit. And from what I understand, um, I think this kit and I believe the diver down kit may be the only two, two kits from the old days that he still actually owns. Like, I think he's donated oh, cool. away a lot of them. And I think he still has this kit sans any of the Simmons stuff. Like, I think all that stuff is gone. 
which you know, nice. Which is kind of weird because means a lot to him. Yeah. Well, it's a little odd to me only because the Simmons, um, the Simmons drums are like you know the main component. Like you know that was the focal main component of that set, and and they're gone. Yeah. So. I mean, maybe he likes just, I mean, clear Vista lights have a certain thing to them that are yeah. just cool. They're just cool looking, clear anything, DW, yeah. Tom, whatever brand. It's yeah. like, they're just, they're neat looking. So yeah, yeah that's and, a cool one. And I mean, you know, I'm sure he's got a little bit of sen- sentimental here and there. I know I've said that he's not overly sentimental, but you know, I mean, he's got, I think he's got some stuff, but, and so yeah. the last picture I'll show you, which is somewhat embarrassing, but as, um, as I mentioned, I was really like, I got hot to try to get myself a Simmons kit. And so I, um, you know, I had no clue what I was doing. And so the funny thing to note is I saved up a bunch of money from some crappy summer jobs and I bought myself some Sim- a Simmons kit, basically an SDS 1000. And, um, and I went for some reason I went with white. And the only thing I could recall is that I believe that the, the black was sold out. And so I was too impatient to wait. So I went with yeah. white. So I tried it, and I bought these like cheap rocker bass drums from Ludwig, brand new, and they were they were so low end. And so I put this kit together, and there's me the, playing the thing in high school. And so, <laughs> oh, that's cool. And so, yeah, so I had you know like five Simmons pads. So of course, a Simmons kit comes, you know, the kick drum and four pads. So I couldn't be conventional; I had to be just stupid. So I custom ordered five pads, and then I and of course I didn't realize at the time that when Alex got five Tom sounds from Simmons, that he had two brains, like, yeah, like a brain. A Sim- very expensive. Exactly. A Simmons brain comes with, you know, kicks near and three Toms. Although I think with the SDSVs, you can probably add or subtract whatever in it. But at the time, you're like, I'm looking at a Simmons brain that came with, you know, the, the Tom, the three Toms. Ba- so I could, if I wanted to, I could manipulate the bass drum to be a floor Tom, but the snare drum didn't sound like, you know, so I got convinced yeah. by the store that I needed to buy a drum machine and a trigger. And then I, you know, and so I went through all this crap and long story short, it was just, um, it was a silly idea. But the one thing I wanted to know is like, you know, like here's like one of the pads that I still have. But if you look at the playing surface on the pads that were, you know, that I had, they're, they're more of a rubber and yeah. they're a lot less, you know, harder than the SDSV. So I was yeah. always kind of wondering why Alex, you know, even though he had a Simmons pad pretty much all the way up until about 91, uh, he always remained with an SDSV pad. And I always wondered why he didn't just have one of those, the newer pads that were a little less, you know, cumbersome on the wrists. He must have liked it. I, who knows? I guess I mean, so. And there's a lot of Simmons yeah. purists out there who just, the SDSVs are it. And I, and I get it and all that. And the other yeah. last thing I'll mention about the Simmons, which was cool, is that several years after I had bought this kit, I um, was in a, a music store, and by the early 90s when grunge had come out and all that, the Simmons were like, you know, they were a joke. Sure. So I bought a Simmons SDS-8V, an SDS-8 brain, which I discovered had all the same sounds that Alex had, although it was like a cheaper, smaller version, but it has yeah. twistable knobs on it and... and uh, and so I paid forty dollars for it back then, and they're actually worth some wow. money now. But um, but it, but so if I wanted to, I can get those sounds now, which is kind of funny because I really that is awesome. I really you know fought to try to get those sounds, and it just never I never sounded like it back when I had the the original kit in the eighties when I bought it. But I'm glad yeah. I kept everything in there. You know, yeah. All right. Well, where do we go? Yeah, moving, from there. So next kit. Um, after that tour, um, Van Halen took a little bit of a break, uh, and then they, uh, you know, Sammy put that solo album out and then they got back to work and they started recording the OU812 album. And, um, once, you know, and in the studio, I've heard that he used some Simmons kicks again, but he had acoustic toms this time. And so it sounds more like an acoustic acoustic album, but they still were using the main room of 5150. There wasn't a drum room yet or anything like that. So clearly they figured out how to record, you know, mic'd up toms and stuff like that um, without, you know, without the, the bleed or whatever they did. They figured something out. So that album uh, came out and, and Van Halen actually decided when they went on tour, they went on tour on the Monsters of Rock. And mm-hmm. so they teamed up with um, uh, Metallica, Kingdom Come. It was like a Dawkin, what was it, a Scorpions and Van Halen. And so um, for this tour, Alex created this 
monster size kit. Like, I mean, I guess, you know, granted, we were saying the Diver Down kit may have been one of his biggest. I mean, tactically, I guess the OU812 kit was likely one of his biggest. I mean, look <laughs> at this thing. It's like, yeah. How would you describe this? I mean, it is, it's a circle of, of drums. It, it, it's, it, it's, it almost looks like somebody puked up a drum set. You know, like it just, yeah. like it, it's just, there, there. Or you're just playing. I mean, you're just putting so many drums around in a big circle. It's, so it's the normal four bass drums. Yeah. But they're extended. Yep. They're, they're it's, it, it seems like he could sit any way, any direction he wanted so and be on a different drum set. The stage, obviously, you'll see in this picture, it's a round riser stage that lifted up. But the stage spun in different directions. And so he was able to sort of, you know, kind of like Neil Peart when Neil would, you know, the back kit would flip around. And you'd see Neil spin yeah. around and play the back kit. Um, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's the same similar fashion where he had different sets for different things. So some of them were... Um, some of the some some of the drums were triggering some electronic stuff, and then he had regular acoustic toms, but in power tom depths. And then he had, um, uh, believe it or not, he had a North set. If you ever remember the North drums, that yes, are yes. Um, and I, I was just noticing that in there, kind of tucked in between. Yeah. So he, I, I heard this story somewhere. I wish I knew more about it, but apparently he acquired this vintage North set that somebody was selling somewhere and it was white. And so I think if I were to guess that he built the kit around this North set, um, see, there's another photo and you see the power toms, but the yeah. other thing to note, you'll see in this picture, which is clear as day is he's playing like a very large, like an either probably an eight by 14 Tom of snare. You can see the Tom logo in this picture. Yeah. Loves the Tama snare. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. So he's playing this giant Tama snare. And um, and he's also using a, like, uh, I'm going to guess it might be an early form of rims mounts. I forget when rims actually came. On a came. rack. Yeah. And he's on a rack. Like, I forget when rims mounts came out and stuff. You can see him using like these rims mounts on the, on the, the toms. And then you can actually see like on the, um, the bass drums, you can actually see the seam between the two kick drums. So on the yeah. the kick drums, I think were 28 by, like he actually went, I think some smaller sizes, 28 by 22. But um, um, if I were to guess, he probably sm made the kick drums smaller just for the power tom depths. If you put those power toms on a 26, they'd be way the heck up there, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, now, is that a, like behind him, is that the gong? Yeah, I believe so. Like it, that's okay. Cause in, in one picture, the one, the aerial kind of one that you showed before, I'm like looking at it and I'm yeah. like, or is that some giant stretched? Like it, it looks, it's the gong I'm sure, but it, it's some angles. It looks like a giant, like stretched, well, it, like it does. And you know, frame drum or something. I, but. I don't quite, I don't honestly quite understand or remember what that was because like the colors um, washed out of it. Yeah. I, I mean, I saw this tour and I, and I, I remember him having a gong, like, not like a, not like that, but I don't know. Cause it, it has like a center. It's like, it almost has like a, a CS dot kind of head, in the middle, like a black dot in the middle, but there are so many symbols on this kit. Oh, too. so speaking of, so speaking of symbols, like here's an ad they did for Peisty and you can actually see like it lists all the, you know, you can see in the picture how they have all the symbols set up and. And it's funny to see the guys in the background, like sort of, you know, like like the kit must be set up at a um, uh, what do you call it a uh, like a like a just a theater auditorium. So I'm like yeah. wondering if they set it up for like, you know, the poor roadie had to set this thing up for like a photo shoot, you know. Yeah, but I mean, setting these a, a kit up like this must have taken quite some time. Hours. I mean, easily. I, I'm sure they got it figured out because, like you said in the last one, like you'd kind of probably at the end of the night you'd want to get done and get to get yeah. to party in. That's another thing I probably should have mentioned in the, when we we're talking about 5150. So Alex's longtime tech friend, um, Greg Emerson left. And so oh. I don't, I don't know ex exactly the reasons why he left, but I think, so when Sammy Hagar joined the band, the uh, original Van Halen manager, like, um, like they parted ways with him. He actually wrote a book not while that long ago. Noel Monk has a book, but they, when Sammy Hagar joined, they actually took Sammy Hagar's manager, and he was actually a really smart guy, like a real good business guy. And I guess he really fit in well with the you know the whole thing. And and so I think he just sort of cleaned house as far as like you know sort of starting from scratch. And and one of the things that happened was Alex ended up getting 
this guy, I believe it was his name was Rob Kern, who now mm. became his tech around 1986. And so um, I think it was more of like, you know, before where it was Alex's buddy that probably didn't ever even yeah. play drums. I think Rob Kern was like a real bona fide, you know, drum tech. Yeah, so from, s- setup was probably more efficient and more I, it, like processes, processes and things like that. And it may have been. And I mean, obviously I, I can't rag on Greg because I mean, all the years that he did, oh, totally. you know, whether he was a drummer or not, I'm sure he learned it pretty quick and he had, a, he had a lot of drums to set up in those early years. Um, so I'm sure yeah. he got good at it, but Rob Kern was probably a, likely a drummer. They probably were easier, you know, to sound check if Rob Kern was able to sound check the kit. And, and so, um, so yeah, so yeah. he took on the job, and the other thing to note, and I will touch on this just ever so briefly, um, but it's sort of relevant to the the story, is that um, uh, Eddie and Alex's father sadly passed away in between the 5150 album and the OU812 album, and when he passed away at 66 years of age, um, he had basically been a lifelong alcoholic. I, can, I think he was kind of pleading with both of his sons to, to sober up. And so Alex, um, which I just find just pretty amazing, just basically like quit drinking. And I mean, you know, again, I'm not trying to touch on this stuff too much, but he was clearly like to have a drink back in the day. And supposedly he just like stopped, like done, stopped. And, um, And I find that pretty amazing that, that he, you know, I'm sure maybe he might not have been the, you know, I'm sure it was probably some grouchy days where, you know, he didn't, you know, but the fact that he was able to yeah. just quit and stop like that is amazing to me because obviously as the, as we all know, it took a lot longer and a long time for Eddie, you know, it just was harder for him. Yeah. But, um, you're in Van Halen, you, you know, get, you get it. I mean, not, I don't want to say you get a pass, but like you're the prototype of like rock and roll, like excess, so good for him. Yeah, yeah that's great. And I mean, it's that's a, great. the other thing to note too, obviously when you, you say all that, but at this stage in their lives, every one of them was married and, um, yeah. you know, Alex had a kid this year, his son, Arik, and, um, you know, Sammy Hagar already had kids. Um, his oldest son's like my age. And I mean, you know, so they were, they were all family men, yeah. not to say that, you know, they didn't do have some fun, but I mean, you know, they were, it, things got a lot more serious. And I think that was another thing that bonded them when Sammy Hagar came in the band. It was just, you know, they were a lot more um, on the same page as far as like David the Ross never yeah. been married. And he's, you know, he's just, you know, he's more of a free wanderer and they're, yeah, they're older. It's a different generation. It, exactly. It's more responsibilities. So, yeah. So I think Alex is playing probably it, I, in my opinion, between this period of 1988 and 1995, I feel like his technique really got refined. Like you'll see, cool. you know, and like, you know, if you watch videos from like 91 and 95, like he's really started to like hone down on his technique and he's really got that stuff down. And the other thing real quick to, so we, you know, move from this kid, but like the, yep. uh, um, he also had one SDSV pad, you know, uh, with the you know coming through the brain where he would do the end of his solo, he would do the big build up, and uh, and if anybody was you know wondering what this kit was like live, there's actually a pretty good pro shot video from the OU812 tour from Japan from 1989. So mm-hmm. they finished up. So basically, they played the Monsters of Rock into the summer, and then when the summer when the Monsters of Rock tour ended, they went back on the road, all you know on their own. So when they went back on tour again, I saw the tour again, and um, and it was great because they were out on their own and they got they played. I want to say close to three hours. And the other thing I say mentioned before in like one of the earlier episodes, I have a friend of mine now who actually recorded at fifty one fifty, and he recorded with his camp co kit in there named Len Campanaro, and um, he was in the band Private Life, which was produced by Eddie. Um, he produced their album, and so. Um, they recorded it at 5150 and i think they you know he could correct me but i mean they i think they recorded it between the break between monsters of rock and uh when they went on the road again but when they went on the road cool. again they took uh private life as the opening act so i saw private life um you know and and len actually got a uh, a brand new ludwig set uh 
courtesy of Alex Van Halen, hooked him up with Ludwig, and and so awesome. he got a Ludwig kit, which he still owns, and he's still he's still gigging every weekend, which is kind of wow. which is kind of cool, but um, very cool. But he's a really yeah. cool guy, and he had some great stories. But but my point of this was that he recorded with Don Landy engineering the album, and he recorded in fifty one fifty with an entire full on acoustic drum set. You know, and it, the album sounds fine. No problem. No problem. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it worked fine for him because the drum room wasn't built. I mean, I think after the, the tour ended in, uh, you know, those Japan shows in 89, it was like February or so, they took a really long break between the next album and all. And, um, and in that time, I think they basically added to the studio and they built like a drum room. So now they had this completely like sliding glass doors into this yeah. second area where they could put the drum set back there and completely isolate cool. it from everything. So they put a lot of work into doing that. The other thing too is um, I can't really tell in this picture. He eventually started using Bay internal mics for toms and stuff. And I can't tell if that's what that is. That's down low on the, one of the toms there, but he definitely got into those later on by the next kit. Yeah. Which really cleans things up um, to use those. I'm sure there's pros and cons to every yeah. kind of miking system, but but really, I mean, he's he's got so much stuff going on to have a bunch of you know four twenty ones or whatever sticking in front of him on big boom stands. They weren't these things weren't being clipped on, so yeah. so it, it cleans things up. Yep. So you know, as we uh, move into the next phase here, so yeah. they, I told you they took a pretty extended break, and the other major change they had is when they released OU812. I guess they were they were not as quite as happy with the um, some of the sounds on the album. The way um, you know Alex was Alex was every much as bit of a tone chaser that Eddie was, and he was always looking for that elusive drum sound and the the way he wanted things. And and I guess Alex. Finally, by the time the uh, next album came out, which was, you know, for unlawful carnal, carnal knowledge, um, I, I guess he really just sort of brought his inner John Bonham out because, I mean, he was a big John Bonham fan as well as Ginger Baker. But when it came to this album, they ended up uh, using Andy Johns as a producer, who was the guy that basically engineered Led Zeppelin IV. And so Alex really went mm. kind of crazy with trying to, like, get the bottom type of sound so all the simmons all that was gone um no more you know simmons kicks none of that stuff he had uh, a massive bass room in the studio probably you know like a bottom sized bass room i've heard conflicting stories of, of what it actually was for the studio but um but he got this very wide open sound so if you actually go from the sound of oh you went one two to the next you know for unlawful carnal knowledge there's a huge difference in the sonic sound of like the low end, you know, also on OU812, Michael Anthony is barely audible on that album. I don't know yeah. what, what the deal was with that, but he does. Was, they, I don't Bands did that. I, I never got the Metallica. Yeah, famously, they, they, it's you know, right at the same it's time. Like, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't understand that at all. Cause that I can't yeah. barely listen to the injustice for all with like the lack of bass in there. It's weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but Michael Anthony sort of suffered the same treatment when it came to Oi oh, Went Too. His bass was really low. So when it came to do this album, he kind of said to Andy Johns, you know, hey, the bass was kind of low in the, that album. Can we can we bring the bass up? And he goes, well, yeah, I'll just turn it up. You know, and he yeah. like, you just, there you go. There you go. You know, so he <laughs> like, you know, and I think he was, Mike was probably playing like an old Fender jazz at the time. And so they, you know, they got this. Led Zeppelin -y phase going, and so the album has a little bit of a, a Led Zeppelin thing going on with it. And the other thing, too, with like you know, you listen to old Led Zeppelin records, Jimmy Page would call it the army of guitars, where he would overdub all these different guitar parts. Eddie sort of sure. got into a little bit of that, whereas in previously, he was mostly like you know, did a lot of the one take, you know, solos, everything in the. I think yeah. there's a lot of layered guitars on the Unlawful Cardinal Knowledge album, which is a different change. Yeah. In the essence of going on, you know, Led Zeppelin, I think um, when it came to the actual, like the tour, Alex um, really like took a left turn from the previous kit. He went from this OU812 kit, which was just a behemoth. And then he went to um, playing this tiny, you know, it was the first time ever he played single bass drum. And he got this, you know, hmm. I, mean, I mean, you can't get any more radically different than this. And, you know, you can see he's playing like a, um, a beer chrome finish. He's got more standard depths on the tom sizes, so he's got you know eight by ten, eight by twelve, the sixteen by sixteen, sixteen by eighteen. But the bass drum is like a um, 
a 20 by 22, I think. And so it's this mm. big, huge thing. And then he's got um, kind of almost like a throwback to sort of the Van Halen 2 set. He's got these giant, I don't know, I think they're just attached on somehow. Like like you see these giant chrome pipes that come off the side. There are probably, what would you say, like eight inches in diameter, six to yeah. eight inches. And then there's like the heavy duty connector almost on like a, like uh, there's probably other better analogies, but like a fire hydrant yeah. size, like connector. Yeah. And then, it's, I mean, it's, it, it looks cool. It's, yep. Yep. it's a big giant pipe. Yeah. It's, it's like huge spurs, you know, to keep and it. It's, from, it's definitely, you know, but this kid was complete. Complete left turn. And of course he's using a rack. Um, and then you can see he still has one Simmons pad way off, you know, like a black Simmons pad way off to the side. Cause he was still at the end of his solo was doing that build up thing that he had been doing since, you know, the nineteen eighty four tour and and beyond before maybe even. But um yeah. the only thing I remember, you know, and there's um they have a pro shot video from this tour as well, uh, which I believe is called right now right here, right now video. But he, I don't know if he's using an SDSV as the brain or not, but the sound is not, it's not very clicky. So when you, when he does the roll at the end, the sound just really gets lost. I don't know what the sound was, but I'm, I can't say I cared for it all that much because mm. it just wasn't, it didn't have the same attack or the sound of the, the SDSV. And, and it could have yeah. been a V and they just um, altered the sound somehow. I don't know, but I don't think it is. It doesn't sound like a V to me for the brain sure. but nonetheless he you know he had a pad in there and this is the last time you will ever see a simmons pad in one of his kits and it was well, they're getting out they're getting out of uh style at this point a yeah, little and bit it's but um 1991 we're in and so okay the, the the band they brought on tour with them was alice and chains so they're into the grunge and all that and uh and so they embraced you know they embraced that sammy uh, and Eddie got along great with the guys in Alice in Chains. And so it sort of kept them, you know, they were, there were a lot of bands that disappeared in those early 90s. Yeah. It almost looks like he has auxiliary hi hats over on his right as well under the um, ride over there. Or am I mistaken? I mean, those look like hi hats. Actually, you know what? They do look like hi hats. I know he had a China over that way, but you know, yeah, you almost looks like now an that you mentioned it, they look thing. like X hats there. I don't remember. Yeah seeing those before but yeah those they definitely i you know th and that's the thing with him it's like we've talked about it before is he was always changing stuff around like moving you yeah, know experimenting it's, it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint exactly what was what because he was constantly you know experimenting yeah. in and and that's the funny thing that you know that I, I love about alex is like he's definitely one of those guys that does his own thing where like you know there are a lot of people that you can say like might follow trends or this or that but it's like if he wanted to do something, he was like, this is what I'm doing, and I could care less what anybody thinks. Yeah. And I mean, if I want tubes coming out of this to that, he loves the tubes. Yeah. That's his, and, that's his thing. And so, of course, you know, he probably, a lot of people would think, you know, oh, my God, you had all these ridiculous kits that no person in, you know, would ever need that many drums. And he would always be like, who cares? It's my kit. Like, you know, I don't care. It's awesome. It's, 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 it's cool. It's, there's, I mean, whatever. People might say, oh, that's so 80s or whatever. But it's like, no, that is... More drums equals more drums to look at equals it's awesome. And it's more just gear is the, the gong. A couple of things here. The gong looks like maybe it's back down to the yeah, 40. I think it gong. is. I think it is actually. And and then are those the firework tubes back there? So there's so the gong on top has, you know, whatever. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ish. I tubes. You you could be right about the fireworks, but I think those might be lights. Oh, lights. Okay, I something lights. something visual. What are those? Are those his monitors? Those kind of covered yeah. boxes? Um I, I think um he, you know, as I said, we've discussed he liked he liked to have Eddie very loud and he needed to hear okay. Eddie. And um and it almost looks like those are Eddie's cabs, but they covered them up just to take away some of the harshness out of it. So as you mentioned yeah. you know, a couple of minutes ago about how they're, you know, so by 1991 now, they're like 12 years into, you know, not including the club days, but you're like 12 years into a professional touring career. Uh, and then you add in all the club days. I don't think Alex ever wore hearing, hearing protection ever. So I would mm. well imagine by this point in his career, he, he was probably took a real beating on his ears. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. feisty symbols are, you know, they're great symbols, but they're loud. They can be very bright, bright and loud, yeah. and they, they cut through the music really well. Um, 
So I imagine his ears took a real beating on this. You can also see, and it's hard to really see on this. I might have a better picture down the line. The base room had, it looked like it's just a black head, but there's a picture on there and it looks like it's like a fingernail of some woman or something. Like it's just, okay, I don't know if you, cool. you can kind of see it, but um, he was also using like, I, I, I think it was another eight by 14, but it's like a Tom, you know, another Tom of snare, but it's in a chrome finish. Now, I don't know if he did what Neil Pear did and just like, you know, when Neil had that slinger and then they just rewrapped it or stained it to match a kit which I, I can't believe he did that, you know, but whatever. I, I just would have been scared that it would have changed the tone. You know, like yeah. I'm one of those guys where like if something sounds good, I don't want to touch it again. <laughs> yeah, like I've had heads on snares and bass yeah. drums for like 15 years. <laughs> yeah, I, I was the exact same way. Like if it sounds good, like I'm not going to mess with this thing. And it blows yeah. my mind that Neil would just like rip a finish off or, you know, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Does he have a double bass pedal? Yeah, he's a... Uh, Always played double bass, so he's got a double pedal of some sort going on. And I think would that be a Ludwig or would it be a um so BW? I'm trying to think of or Yamaha. I think it's either a Yamaha or a Tama. I think he was kind of like okay. doing, you know, and at this point too, he was starting to uh use some DW hardware here and there. Um uh you just for you know, ease of I mean, Ludwig has always made great drums, but I think they've always sort of um, fallen a little behind as far as the hardware goes, at least back in those days. And I, obviously things turned around for him. Like the whole nostalgia Ringo thing has kept Ludwig alive for years, but uh, they had some pretty yeah, sure. pretty rough years in there in uh, the early, late eighties, early nineties, when they're, especially when they were transitioning from Chicago to North Carolina. It's actually kind of, you know, a little sidebar story, which is kind of funny is I took a, a factory tour in 91 and, um, and real brief, you know, when I got to the end of the tour, I actually said to my my tour guide, who's Dick Jurlock, who, which of course I wish I'd known this, was a, worked at Ludwig in the 60s. I could have asked him a million questions, but I didn't. I was 21. I didn't really know who he was. And um, yeah. so um, I said to him at the end of the tour, do any famous people come through the tour? Knowing full well that, like, you know, I was kind of thinking about Alex in my head. And he said, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. we've had Ed Shaughnessy here. We've had some other guys. and And he goes... Are you a Van Halen fan? And I was like, oh, kind of, you know, and a little bit. A little bit. And he goes, oh, gee, he goes, that's too bad. And I said, why is that? And he goes, well, we've been trying to get Alex to take this tour for a really long time now. And um, he was actually, we lined him up to come. Uh, he was actually supposed to come and he looks at his watch. He goes, you would have been taking the tour with Alex. And I went, wait. Oh what you're talking God. about willis you know i was like what and he goes he goes uh yeah we had lined him up to take this tour and it was the same time the year here but he goes um sammy hagar got sick so they had to postpone the show in charlotte and they you know and make up some, oh, or something like that and i was like are you kidding me right now that would have been a once in a lifetime i mean that would have been like nothing else yeah it's like a tour of the factory of ludwig without i okay but no but it oh, wasn't boy. meant to be so it never happened it's almost like don't tell me that. I don't <laughs> like now. Yeah. So, but you, it, well, what could have been? What could yeah. have been? But, you know, what do they say? It could have been a contender. Oh, well, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, with this kit, you know, so it's a pretty basic kit. Um, I think, what are your thoughts on it? As a Van Halen fan, do you see this and you go, oh, I hate it? It's a small bass drum kit, or is it? I don't actually hate it at all. Um, uh, I'm sure it was better for the sound guy, too, to like sort of have a lot less to deal with. But truth be told, I mean, I just, when you're talking about Alex Van Halen, I think he looks best with at least two bass drums. I don't think he has to have, you know, four bass drums, but he at least has to, you know, I just like the look of him with two. You know, it was a nice, again, like with the Simmons, like I knew the Simmons couldn't last. I thought it was really cool for the time, but he moved on to other, and this was just another phase in his career, which I thought it was cool. Yeah. And, and again, I like the fact that he just didn't care what anybody thought. Like, you know, he was, no, and he sounds good on it's, it's him. Yeah. He sounds good. And you can put him on, you know, playing brushes on a pizza box and I'm sure he would sound incredible. Absolutely. You know? And it, it, it just, his feel comes through everything. And, uh, so I, I liked the kit, but so as we, um, he used it all through 91 and 92 for the tour, the tour lasted a long time. Um, I actually, I used it for as far as I know, like a little bit into, um, the early part of 93 when they did some European shows. Um, but they actually released a live album and a video from those, you know, 91 shows. I guess they recorded the bulk of it in uh, uh, Fresno, California. And so um, 
they were t- they decided to go on tour again off the touring off of the live album. But when they first went out, or or they were you know he was touring with that other kit that the same kit. But um, from what I've been told too, like I've talked to like Todd Trent, who used to be the artist relations for Broadway and all, and um, I I think there was I know there was two sets, but there may have even been three, so um, identical sets, so they could sort of like you know hop around a lot easier with having you know the kits, you know like you could bring one one place and have the other one go somewhere else, and so uh, I know there was two, but there may have even been three. So when I went out to um, Las Vegas in 98, and then I, I think I told you I, I took a trip to L.A. and I saw the Fair Warning kit. Well, when I was in Las Vegas at that same time, they actually had one of the tour kits on top of a bunch of slot machines. So this is a picture I took. Oh, cool. So there's the kit on top of some slot machines, which is weird to see. Like, walk around in this casino hard rock, and there it is. They're like, wow. But I think somebody told me that this particular kit – was the one that he used in the European shows. And of course, you know, whoever set it up did a whack job of it. And they're yeah, and they have a, too far over and yeah. A super sensitive with it. And then you can see it also looks like he's using some Remo muffles. You know, those things that they used to make Remo made and you put them in. Yep. And so there's like you know, no padding in the bass drum but a Remo muffle. So yeah, so that's you know, that's that kit. When they moved on and then they went back out and they went to the ninety three um he actually got another double bass kit. And so, um, at the, you know, at this time, um, Ludwig was making classic drums. They were making, um, so I think shells came in either six ply or a uh, four ply. And, you know, they made probably 80% of the drums were all six ply, you know, like a maple shell. And so they were called classics. Um, classic maple drums didn't come out until about 96, maybe 97. So I know there are a lot of people that like to call like, you know, 70s and 80s drums classic maples, but they, they weren't invented until much later on. And, uh, and the early classic maples was like a nine ply shell. And from touring the factory, I saw like they would put the uh, plies of wood into a mold and offset them all kind of like what Gretsch did. And that way, you know, they would have a, like a, a, a bladder, like that would just expand and, and yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, Yamaha did that. Yeah. And, yeah. So he was still playing classic series drums. And so when, um, I get into this next kit, let's see, it's a, um, maple finish. He's using like, um, an eight by 10, uh, eight by 12. And then he's got like, um, 16 by 16, 16 by 18. And his bass drums are like 24s. Now, this, you know, even though he had some awesome kits back in the 80s and all, I really like these sizes for Alex. I think they're great. Um, when he goes to an 8x12 and a 9x13, sometimes it almost sounds to me like the um, the toms can get a little bit lost in the 26 in an arena. They're just so big that um, yeah. when you listen to him playing an 8x10 and an 8x12, they're, you know, he's got them pitched up a little bit more. So the spread between a 10, 12, a 16, and an 18, it's a really cool spread. So you get some really great, you know, low end out of the 18, but you get a nice cutting fast attack out of the 10. And so, and then the 24s were just the right manageable size to get a nice punchy kick sound. Um, and then it's around this period. It looks like in this picture, I'm trying to see, he might still be using a Tama uh, for the snare drum. Not 100% sure. sure. I could see, like, it looks like the gate hanging down on that snare drum. And I think that's definitely not something Ludwig did. So it may be another Tama snare drum. And then he, Butt end of the stick, looks like. Well, he had these it? sticks, too, that were made from Regal Tip made them that were just butts. There was no no tip on them at all. Which yeah, because it's grip on the bottom, which, yeah. Yeah, well, they're a little odd. And uh, I failed to mention in the previous kit, I think he was playing the Signature Series for Peisties, and he used those for okay. a bit, which I can't say. I've had some Signature Series, and I love Peisties cymbals, but the Signatures always sound a little on the gongy side to me, whereas in the mm. 2002s, feel like they're a bit thinner and they have more of a shimmer to them. So I much yeah. prefer hearing Alex on 2002s versus... Um, Peisty signatures, and that's just yeah. total preference for me. But but you can see because it looks like he's playing two thousand twos in these in this photo here, and um and you can see like he's got and I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm I'm really sorry, John, if I'm going to screw this up. But uh, John Douglas, 
I may have done the artwork on the bass drums. John Douglas later became his tech, but I think it may have started out with him doing some artwork for him. Um, and of course, John Douglas is a super talented, creative guy who, uh, you know, later became his drum tech and then I was playing with, or he was playing with Aerosmith and does amazing work. Yeah. And so, um, looks like we have headphones on now. Yeah. As so he's to- using, um, headphones to hear. So Eddie went from, um, playing the keyboards live. He only did that really for one, one tour. He did a little bit of it on the OU812 tour, but they, they started sequencing keyboard parts. And so for songs like jump or, um, why can't this be love or dreams or whatever, you know, they, uh, Alex had to hear the tunes. And so they were, he had a kind of like Neil Parody had his giant set of headphones. You can see how yeah. they're sort of taped to his head almost. And yeah, then, to keep from like rocking back and dropping off. And I don't, I don't know if he would get bored on tour, but you can see he's got like some really crazy Fu Manchu thing going, and he you know does. he starts, you know, like hey, you know, they start getting into that. But there's not a very, there are very, very few pictures of that kit. Um, I really couldn't find many more than than that. And but it's a pretty standard, you know, uh, classic set of Ludwig's in a maple finish. And around this time, Ludwig was pretty much stopped offering wrapped finishes for the most part because i mean i can attest i you know um the wrap finishes were having all kinds of problems with shrinking and cracking and they're just you know mm. going through a bad period with that but the um yeah but the natural drums were good and all that so um so they did this tour uh i actually saw two back-to-back shows uh the the, the thing that's interesting to know about tours is when you go and see one show and this has always sort of made me think when I do a gig that like when you go and see all these shows and um, people are uh, playing a certain way, like you're only seeing one night out of how many shows yeah. they do on a tour. So I saw yeah. back-to-back shows and I'll never forget they were interviewing Van Halen before the show on a radio station. And then somebody asked where Alex was and they said, oh, he's, you know, he's just a little out of it today. So he's taking a nap on the couch. And so he wasn't part of the interview. Well, we did the, I saw the show that night. He played great. Like, I mean, there was never a bad night. He always played really well, but it just like, it just, I don't know. It just was like, he did the show. It was good. They're human, but it was I human mean, people. And yeah. the next night, uh, I went back for the next night. Well, apparently Joey Kramer and Steven Tyler from Aerosmith were there being Boston guys. And I could actually see him standing behind Alex's gong. And the Jeez. second night, cool. and I mean, it was the same show. They did the same thing. The, the vibe from Alex, like, I don't know, like when Steven Tyler's standing behind you, you, know, you put the show on, you know, like, yeah. you know, like, you, you know, like I, it, yeah, you, f- you feel energized it was, by the, yeah, it, it was the same show. I mean, it was like the same as the night before they played great, but there, I felt, I felt it. Like I felt there was something energy wise going through my body that was not there that first night. And Alex just. I mean, he crushed that show. I'm like, that's awesome. I, I just, I, it's so weird to witness that, to think like, you know, cause you're right. People are human, but then to see them take it to like, okay, this car can do 80, but I'm pushed it to 120. Like, like it just, <laughs> yeah. I was like, holy crap. They're like, wow, he yeah. really put the, put it into that night. So I was yeah. blown away. The trick by that. to a great show is to have Steven Tyler standing behind you and Joey Kramer. Oh, it's, That's the secret. <laughs> it makes me wonder like, you know, nobody would ever say this, but it was like, you know what? We're still, you know, you know, they just, you do it. You know, you're like, yeah, everybody knows it. I mean, you're playing a crummy bar gig or something like that. And all of a sudden, you know, Kenny Aronoff walks into the back of the room. You're going to be like, wait a minute. It's like you, you boost yourself up. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's, so, that's very cool. So yeah. they go, they finish that tour. They went back into the studio and to record the balance album. They were working on that album. Um, at this point in the band, there were some tensions going on. The, uh, the band's manager had passed away from cancer. And so, um, he was kind of, it's weird. It almost parallels the Beatles in some way. Whereas in like when Brian Epstein died and, they had yeah. a sort of all these weird things going on, and, and a lot of that yeah. happened to them. And um, all of a sudden, there was some mistrust going on with Sammy Hagar, and you know, it's all you know drama stuff. But they uh, they recorded this album, Balance, and Balance album. It's a really great sounding album, but it's a lot more of a darker sounding album than any Van Halen previous album. It just sort of you know maybe the grunge that was coming out. But who knows? But the other thing is that Alex was getting a little more experimental as far as maybe in the studio. Like I've seen some studio footage and he was um, actually using some DW toms 
Like uh, the first time I'd ever really seen him stray from Ludwig. He was using Ludwig bass drums and floor toms, but he had some DW toms. And um, and it, and I think, and I again, I think I heard this from Jim Catalano. I mean, the, Ludwig had some pretty rough goings, you know, in maybe, you know, the late 80s, early 90s. And I think there was a small, small period in there where Alex was, um, um, Eddie, Eddie basically had started getting his guitars made by PV. And so I think there was a small period where PV was trying to court Alex and get him to potentially play their drums. And, um, and, and there's actually like a video from one of those, you know, one of the songs and it's a really dark, you know, colored video. So it's really hard to see, but Alex is actually playing a PV radial kit in this video. You know, I think it was just basically like they were, he just was trying it out for some reason. But according to uh, Jim, like he, his words were basically like, thank God Alex decided, you know, to stick with Ludwig. Cause he, you know, eventually, you know, changed his mind and went straight back full on Ludwig. So, um, yeah, thankfully Alex never, you know, straight from Ludwig. Cause I just, I think of Ludwig as I think of Alex, you know? And, um, yeah. so when he started the ballots tour, he had a kit that was very similar to the previous kit, um, uh, the maple kit from the, uh, the right here right now tour. Um, but he used more of a, I guess, power Tom. It was, it was, it was close. And, um, uh, I think the bass drums were like still 24s. Um, but you can see like his, maybe like an eight by 10, but it was probably like a 10 by 12 or something. You know, it's a longer, longer Tom. Maybe he felt he needed a, a deeper Tom or whatever, but he's using like a, an Emerald shadow. I believe was the color called. Yeah. But I like it. It's, it's got a nice look to it. Yeah. I like it a lot too. It's a, it's a green, um, green color and, uh, yeah. It's a very cool, but the thing that's odd to note, and I still, again, I don't really understand the reasoning for this, is um, halfway through the tour, he got another kit, which was basically the same kit, but it was in like a either a mahogany or a cherry stain. So, like, there's actually video of them playing at the Toronto Amphitheater in 95, and he's playing like a darker colored kit. It's just, there aren't a mm. lot of great photos of that kit, and it's... um. You know, it's a dark finish, so it's hard to tell. But looking at the catalogs, I'm going to guess, it's, you know, it could either be a dark mahogany or a cherry stain. I don't know why there was a need to, like, switch kits around or, or change in the middle of the tour. Yeah, but he doesn't usually do that. Yeah, he doesn't usually do that. It's usually, like, one kit for a tour. But this, as far as I can tell, the only tour where he literally had two different kits for the tour, two different colors. Mm. And it looked like in some of the photos, and again, there aren't a lot of photos from this tour. Um you can kind of see that, you know, the green stain in there. And he was using, um, you know, like a rims mount. He's using, um, May internal mics still. And I believe yep. it's, uh, a Tama, you know, another Tama snare, like, you know, a Chrome one or something. And the other thing to note, and you'll see in this picture, he's indeed wearing a neck brace. So that, oh, wow. So, what, what's up with that? Well, uh, Sammy has dubbed the tour. He kept calling it the ambulance tour. Uh, because Eddie had hip problems and was limping around with his hip from all the years of knee slides and all that. And, and so yeah. Alex was, um, uh, apparently the story goes is, and it could be a combination of things. It, it was part, could have been a water skiing accident. I've also heard that it, like he herniated a disc when he picked up his, you know, his young son and lifted him up over his head and did something to his neck or I don't know, but he had uh, to wear yeah. a neck brace through the tour. And it's kind of funny because in one of the, the video that's for the um, Toronto show, there's actually like a clip where they show before the show, Alex is putting on the next brace and he says six more months of this crap and it's gone. But that's really probably <laughs> not true because when you see them on the 98 tour, when they had Gary Sharon in the band, he's still wearing a neck brace. So I can't imagine Jeez, it was all that poor, comfortable. Poor guy. Yeah, it was. No, it must be terrible. Yeah, it looks, it look, doesn't look all that comfortable to wear a neck brace. The other thing to note uh, at this period too, which is kind of cool, is um, he um, they were using a video screen, which is sort of new technology. They're using a video screen back there. He pre-recorded himself playing like like a Latin percussion solo. So they call it like it was Latin brother or something. And so he has like a full on, you know, like full man shoe and a headband on. And and so at the end of his solo. And it's in this Toronto video, if you get a chance to see it, where he basically, like, you know, the, you hear the click, the cowbell go off, and he solos basically with himself. And so oh, it's, awesome. it's pretty neat. And so um, so it's kind of neat to see it up on the video screen. It's a real creative little thing he did. And it was nice to see that he was always sort of changing up his, you know, trying. He probably got tired of, you know, I can't do the Simmons pad thing anymore. So he came up with this as an alternative. 
And so he was doing these little solos. The other thing to note, too, which is a real kind of a big deal, is that his I think he was having a lot of problems with his hearing and stuff. And um, for this tour, there was a there's an article out there somewhere. There was a husband and wife that actually invented for Alex the basically like the modern in-ear system as we know of. So like like I'm wearing my in ears now to do this interview, and I think um, you know you'll notice there's no giant cabs next to Alex anymore, no guitars yeah. blaring in his face. But I think he was literally probably, if not the first, one of the first people to use like professionally use in ear monitors, and, and it was built out of mostly necessity. Like I think I thought I'd read somewhere if that had not invention did not come about, there's a chance that he may have had to just sort of stop touring because. It was just, you know, the, the levels and the volume. And so, you know, I, at this point now, when you think of like less monitors on stage and um, internal microphones, the sound probably was a lot easier to control versus sure. like the early days when, you know, when you have, you know, 40 drums on stage and, and Eddie's cabs. And Everything's mic'd. And, and, yeah. And, yeah. So, yeah. So, the con you know, the sound is actually quite good from these, these tours. Very cool. So as we uh, move away from balance era, um, Sammy, you know, left the band. There's, you know, all kinds of stuff on that that anyone could see. Um, there was a brief little point where they put the, everybody thought David the Roth was coming back. That's a whole other, you know, debacle. But they ended up getting Gary Sharon yeah. in the band from Extreme. And um, Alex, uh, they recorded the album and all that, which is a very strange thing because um, I, you know, it's a very disjointed album. Eddie did a lot of the stuff himself, including some of the drum overdubs. Alex was going through some, I think, a rough period. I think he got divorced around this period. And so he just wasn't as involved in the album in previous. I think Eddie did a lot of the bass on this album. I mean, it's, it's a very strange album. It was Eddie's, I think, his concept. And I think it just didn't really go over all that well. Gary Sharon is a great singer. He seems like a great guy, but he just wasn't the right yeah. fit for Van Halen. But Alex uh, got this new kit for the tour, and it's a yellow Classic, I think these are classic maples. I think at this time, classic maples were out. So he was using this classic maple set. And again, I, I want to say that John Douglas probably did the paint job on this. I don't think he was the tech Which is quite yet. Really cool. It's it's very cohesive. With It kind of goes to like, you know, Kits Neal would have or something yeah. where like the bass drum head matches the paint of the kit and the color of everything. It's um, I think it's a neat looking kit. It's, it is a neat looking kit. And I think, um, and I just said, like, I mean, maybe John Douglas was uh, kind of the, t like, I don't know if there was maybe two techs at the time. I don't know if this was the year he first came to work with Alex full time, but he was in the fold for sure. And I believe he did all the painting on this. Um, and uh, the the thing, um, what I understand is I believe it's supposed to read um, Van Halen 3 in Sanskrit. I'm not really oh. sure. It is something cool. It, it looked kind of cool. And it, it's, he went back to like more like the 8x10, 8x12, uh, 16, 18, and then like 24-inch bass drums. And um, Super sensitive? Um, looks like we're back to yeah, a Ludwig Yeah, so it snare. looks like he went back to a Ludwig, um, I believe it's a uh, uh, like a bronze hammered, super sensitive. And, and it was just, it's funny to note because, I mean, again, I, you know, saw my first Van Halen show in 86 and I'd seen every tour up, you know, all the way through. And, um, and this was a completely different snare. I've seen him playing the Tamas. I saw him on all of his Tama phases and he went back to this, you know, a metal snare drum. It's not a wood anymore. And it sounded like Alex. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, it just, it's just yeah. great. It sounded like Alex. And so, um, yeah. and so he did, so he did that. And I actually, um, I saw like this uh, a couple of shows on this tour, and uh, and again while I wasn't a huge fan of Gary, it just one thing that struck me completely was just how amazing Michael Anthony Edward and Alex were together. Like they just were so tight as a unit, and uh, so yeah. it was really cool to see that. But um, you know, I think he had some congas on this kid as well. Let me see if I have another picture of it. Yeah, I can see him on uh, one of them. Looks like off to his left, and there's and there's also like. You know, he's got the fan attached to the kit, so he's got something, some cooling power. Yeah, fan off the yeah. side, and you can see, you know, the the snare drum a little more clearly in this. And uh, it looks like yeah. he has like forty two strand snares on it. I mean, you can kind of see in the bottom mm. there. 
And so uh, the other thing that happened actually on this tour early on, and this is a testament to Alex as well, is that um, I guess they were playing when they first started the tour, they played in Europe and um, um, they were playing in some really old theater doing sound check and a giant piece of uh, plaster fell from the ceiling and it actually like landed and whacked Alex's arm. I forget which arm, it was his left arm or something. But it was, you know, it was like cinder block that fell down. It's lucky it didn't yeah. actually like smash the kid apart or hit Alex in the the head or. Um, yeah. But I think it, was he okay? Well, I think he, you know, it sort of like messed up his arm. Like they they basically had to postpone all the early shows of the European, you know, so Alex could sort of like I think his tendons and stuff were a little screwed up and. They, uh, so, so basically they had a little bit of a break before the tour started. And it was funny because I saw a comment from Eddie where when they got back to, you know, when the first show happened after all that, it was, I think it was one in the States. Eddie was saying that like, you know, he was struggling because he was like, you know, we had a break and I hadn't played for a while. And I was like, I was struggling to like, sort of like get my fingers warmed up and I look over and there's Alex just just cooking, flying away, you know, and he was just like, what the heck? And <laughs> ready to ready go. To go. But like, I mean, he, he just, in the photo we're looking at, he's got a neck brace on yep, still. So, yep. I mean, man, I mean, you're getting beat up. You got, you know, yeah, plaster, you plaster falling, falling, falling down, down your arm. You got a neck brace, neck brace on. on. Wow. And so, um, so yeah, so that was the Van Halen three tour. And, and, and sadly okay. Van Halen three just did not do anywhere near what they expected it. You know, Eddie hoped it would do. Um, the, uh, Gary, I guess they went and, there's supposedly rumors that they got most of the way through a second album, but it just got scrapped. Like all of a sudden, you know, and by this time, you know, I think I had internet by the time, you know, like early 2000s, 2001, um, you know, it just came out on the, on like a Van Halen website that they parted ways with Gary Sharon. So we, um, we go into sort of a dark period where like, you know, you just don't hear anything from Van Halen for a while. And then around 2004, um, they reunited with Sammy Hagar. They decided to, you know, come back and get him yeah. going. And um, without getting into the drama too much, I mean, it was just not the greatest time for Eddie. He was really in bad shape. He was uh, going through some health issues and some other things. And he probably shouldn't have been on tour, but he was in pretty rough shape. I saw a couple of shows at the Centrum, and it was really kind of sad because the original first show I saw there in 86 at the Centrum was just so amazing. And to see, you know, the shape he was in in these 2004 shows was not great. But, but it, you know, yeah. what we're talking about, Alex, and Alex, you know, played his ass off, played really well. Um, sure. And he got uh, another kit for the for this tour. And so at this time, by this time, John Douglas was really his tech. Um, and I think Al, uh, John did the, uh, the Dragons. You know, it's a dragon motif going around the kit. He has, um, very cool, you know, classic maple drums again, 26 inch bass drums. And that little one, off the, I say little, but the bass drum off the side <laughs> is a 24. And then he's got like, you know, back to like 12, 8 by 12, 9 by 13, 16, 18. Um, he's got some pork pie tube drums, is what I, what I read they were called. Oh, cool. And they have dogs. So he's, that's awesome. Yeah. They have Dawes pads installed in them so he could trigger sounds and stuff okay something looks like there's etched like dragons etched yeah. on them or a sticker or something They're, and he's got the like what well, looks like coils like springs kind of going on the bass drum spurs so he's getting back to the like funky stuff on his drum set the dragons were likely either etched or painted because john douglas is a is a crazy crazy artist that can paint anything he did all those easy top kits he's done you know the aerosmith kits a lot of kits um and so he, yeah. you know, and I think, at, I think uh, as far as I understand, John Douglas kind of had to work at Alex a little bit. Like, like this kid is maple finish. It's fairly ordinary finish. I think it was later on, you know, when um, John Douglas really got Alex to like say, you know, okay, I trust this guy. Let's, you know, let him do his thing and, and, and really get creative. Yeah. I think this was just a very, very tip of the iceberg for John as far as getting creative on Alex's kits. And I, you know, they say I, yeah. the Dawes pads and those things, but I saw these shows. I don't ever remember Alex ever hitting those things. I mean, maybe he did, but I mean, he's got quite a few of those things. There's at least like eight of them around there, you know, and it's like, huh. I don't remember him hitting them once, but you know, Again, yeah, you know, we're trying to put on a show here. We're trying to, yeah. Um, I like the wood grain looking bass drum head with this kit. Yes, 
uh, which is yeah, super right. cool. There's mm-hmm. something I've seen other people do that. He, maybe Alex was the first, but like it just kind of makes the whole thing Good. look like this, like cohesive yep. piece. Nice little shot here, if you can see, or um, and the snare drum, Iron Cobras. Yeah, and you can see the uh, the snare drum too. It's like a Black Beauty, but it has um the dragons etched in it. Um, I believe Alex gave that snare drum to um, Todd Trent, who was, as I mentioned, was the artist relations guy. Like I know Todd had it in his office for a while. I, I think Alex was just the kind of guy that was like, "Here, take this," you know, like Here, have this, you know. And so, um, <laughs> great. And, and, yeah. and Todd was a good, you know, worked with him since you know '86 at least, and uh, and they were good friends. And um, but you can also see when you look at Alex's sticks too, like they're resting on a 16 inch floor tom, and they they're longer than. The, like he was yeah, using like, some really long sticks at this point. They're like two inches longer. And then throne looks cool. I wonder if that was because if he was linked up with Bill from Pork Pie, I wonder yep. if he was using a pork pie throne at that point, because that looks very uh plush and, and comfy. And then also the far left yep. third bass drum, but it's over, it's almost in the first, it's like way, way, way far left. That has like a pedal on it. So I wonder did he spin around, you think, and <laughs> you know play something I mean, over there? I saw the I saw two shows on this tour. I don't really recall him. Do it. And maybe he did in his solo, and I just don't remember. But he's also yeah. got a three by thirteen piccolo snare drum in there, and like I, I just yeah. don't, I don't remember him really doing much with that stuff. Um, hmm. You know, it was really just him playing the the main kit. But you know, maybe it was there just for for spur of the moment things. Like I don't know. I mean, you can yeah. see how there's Dawes pads on either side of him, and I mean that would have yes. been a lot of stuff to trigger. But I don't remember like what he what he was. You know, I, I just don't remember them triggering a lot. They were mostly a, a live band for the for the most part. Uh, he might have triggered maybe when he did his solo and he had to trigger the, the little sequence at the end, or maybe he used that to sort of yeah. you know get that going. But you can see the set list on the the floor, and, and you can see like you know, there's a lot of two thousand twos up there. You can see he's using a um, clear heads and some pin pinstripes at the bottom. You know, and again, everything still sounded like Alex. But as my comment before, when he was playing like the 24 inch bass drums and like the 8x10, 8x12, I always kind of felt that they cut through an arena a little better. Like when you see, when I saw him in the center playing this kit, it just, you know, it kind of gets a little bit lost because you got 26s yeah. that move a lot of air and, you know, 12, 13s, you know, they're, they're just, they're big drums. It looks like we moved away from the internal mics. Like it looks yeah. like he's back to yeah. having mics on top on, all of them. Yeah, and I think you're. I think you're right. He moved away from away from that, and it was a. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the reasonings were. Yeah, but I like this cat. I, I think it's cool. It's it's you know it's it's less. There's not tubes coming off of everything, but it's yeah. It's uh, a very it's cool. nice. You know, get the job done kit. And then the hi hat has that kind of contraption which connects to the second bass drum to get it close enough yep. with the no leg hi hat um, mounted to the bass drum, which you know talk about saving your hips from being spread so you know an, an extra foot well and I, it's pretty cool i probably should have made a picture right a b this shot versus the one i showed you from like van halen too where the high hat looks like it's a mile away and there's a third tom yeah. crammed in there like it just, that still blows my mind like like this is a much more ergonomical setup and i think yeah. as alex aged and he got you know more into the technical side of playing drums it was pretty clear that you know he he wanted to set his things up more ergonomically and more efficient, sure. especially if you know he wore a neck brace for the last three years. You know you yeah. don't want to be doing any extra movement outside of the you know for, for no real reason. You know so you know that that pretty much sums up the 2004 tour. I think he's still I think he's still playing a 40 inch gong at this point. Um, it doesn't look like ridiculous gong size in the back. So, uh, you know, they did that tour. Unfortunately, it just, it didn't end on the best note. You know, as I mentioned, Eddie was having some rough years. And, um, so fast forward to about 2006, 2007, Eddie started jamming with his son Wolfgang. And it was quickly apparent, even at young age at 15, that Wolfgang had the goods to be able to play bass. And, um, and so basically Alex and Eddie and Wolfgang would just, you know, basically after Wolfgang got out of school, they would rehearse and play all these tunes till they got to the point where they were like, I think we actually have something here. And they were just, I think they were yeah. just fooling around until it was decided that, you know, we actually got something pretty good going here. The kid, the kid's got some talent and he can play and, and he can sing their backgrounds. And I think at the, at the time, Wolfgang may have even just been, you know, singing guide vocals for them. And so it was actually Wolfgang's idea. And he said, you know, 
why don't we call David Lee Roth and get him to come back? And so the the funny story is is that, you know, apparently Eddie was like, you know, well, you give him a call. Like basically, I don't think Eddie, you know, had any real desire to to call him. And he was just said, Wolfgang, yeah. you call him. And so the funny story goes is that Wolfgang called him and basically left a voicemail and said, Hi, this is Wolfgang. You know, we've been jamming and we want to know if you want to come up and jam with us, you know, and, and so <laughs> get back in. David Lee Roth, of course, called back and he got Eddie and, it, and, he, and he says, you know, hey, you got you, you, you called me. He goes, I didn't call you. And he goes, well, I got a message from Wolfgang. And he goes, well, then why are you calling me? You know, what I mean? that's funny. You know, it's one of That's those funny. kind of deals. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, well, the Van Halen decided they're gonna uh, take bring Dave back, and they're gonna go on a tour. And they, they they didn't make an album or anything. They just decided to go or like out on a. I, I hate to call it a nostalgia tour, but I guess that's what it is. But um, and at this point, I think you know Dave seemed like he had worked a bit and got his voice in good shape, and um, and so they went out and and John Douglas was. I guess, you know, still Alex's tech and he really uh, went to town on this kid. I think Alex started to like loosen the reins and I don't know if that was the case, but he let John Douglas get real creative and out of the kits that Alex used like later in his career, this is definitely my favorite. I, I love this kid. I think it really came out great. And as we've talked before, I love sparkles and wacky finishes and stuff in that. Not that the natural yeah. maple is cool too, but uh, so the kit John came up with looks like this. And which is incredible. I mean, the bass drums. So, so explain for people just listening the overlapping of the bass. Yeah. Drum. So he basically I mean, he's playing with the shells. So it's basically you know his standard you know two twenty sixes with the um ten you know the twelve thirteen sixteen and eighteen. But what he did was he ended up taking um smaller size bass drums and like I think they they may have been twenty twos and the he cut them like literally into the side of the shell. So he literally like. It, it, they're like fused, they're fused together. together, but they sort of like bubble out from the side of the the set, and it just it's such a cool look, like it's really cool. But it, again, how the hell did they put that in a case? You know, like yeah. But uh, but they you know um, clearly they figured it out, and then it's got yeah. this really cool rack system around it. Um, you know, like sort of piston looking things, and like John Douglas was all about like making, you know, aesthetically making things look really unique and different. And then the finish on here, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I'm gonna guess, and I think it's a a painted finish, but it looks like a teal sparkle, so it's like almost like a cross between green and blue, but it's it's sort of and sort of has like a teal look to it because the the bass drum hoops are all also matching they have the same sparkle but it's a it's a really cool kit 2002s around it you'll see you know some more of the Dawes pads and the the piccolo snare and that kind of you know that sort of thing uh but you'll also see there's a bass drum way over to on this picture to the right it's on you know his Alex's right side um that bass drum believe it or not is actually a mini fridge <laughs> and so really? if you look, this is a picture off the side and there's actually a little refrigerator in there and they put like oh my gosh. cold waters in there for Dave Lee Roth and stuff. And That's crazy. I've never heard of anything like that. And, that, you know, again, it's probably something John Douglas came up with because he was that yeah. kind of guy who was super creative and came up with all kinds of interesting things. So yeah, a uh, couple of more shots at this kit. Um, you can see from, you know, there's a fire extinguisher, which is probably just a, a funny throwback, you know, to, you know, obviously nothing yeah. was on fire. And then, you know, of course, John tricked out this side base room with these like chrome things that stick out of the flaps that stick out of it. I mean, it's just super cool. John's a super yeah. creative guy and he really, really knows how to make stuff really pop. Um, yeah, for the stage. So I, yeah. I really enjoyed this kid. I thought it was a really cool idea and then he actually like must have done another set of heads because they actually some of the shots they say 08 on him instead of 07 so he must have done and he hand paints all that stuff too so it's not like it's a graphic Incredible. they came up with like i'm pretty sure he hand paints that now the other thing to note around this time period which i thought was a little odd is that alex came out with his first signature snare drum and it was basically a Ludwig version of the Rosewood Tama. It was designed to sort of, you know, I don't know, just like this is, you know, the ad for it. But if you note, like, and even in this picture, like Alex is playing a classic maple matching snare to the kit. So I have never actually seen one picture of Alex playing this drum. 
Like I'd never his signature. It never went on tour. Yeah. It never. Like I've just, I've I've heard that he's tried it in the studio and stuff, but like there's a very little studio output from Van Halen at this point in their career, and it, it just it's just kind of bizarre to me. Like it just it's yeah. like he didn't tour with it. At least I didn't see it. I mean, maybe sure. maybe he pulled it out in the later part of the tour, but as far as I know, he was mostly playing that classic maple snare. But these are very, very hard to find and very rare now because this is from about 2007, 2008. And, and, um, and of course, they got limited edition and they got all bought up very quickly. And now they're actually worth quite a bit of money if you can even find one. Um, yeah, I bet. You know, they got the, sure. the Van Halen logo with his little the signature in there. And then the inside of the drum, of course, you can see how it's all rosewood through and through. And it's got his yeah, signed, signed you number know. blank of, oh. you know, nine of 100 yeah. is this picture. But yeah. So there's just, wow. just not, not a lot of them floating around out there. So that takes care yeah. of uh, 2007. So at this point, Dave was technically officially back in the band. Well, apparently, um, uh, per probably Wolfgang's idea, he was a catalyst for a lot of things um, going on with that band. And I guess they decided to put an album out, which was at this career, like a lot of got bands. 2012 they weren't really putting a lot of albums out at this point but they they dug up a bunch of old demos that were from the old warner brothers demo they did back in 77 and uh decided to record some of the songs on there and add a couple of new ones in david lee ross sort of reworked up some of his lyrics and um so they put an album out called a different kind of truth and um it was the first you know new van halen album since the van halen 3 album from 98 and um aside from a couple of songs they did with sammy look couple of 2004 songs this was the first full full album and so when they've completed the album they actually went to um new york city and um dave uh david Lee ross uncle was a uh, uncle manny that owned cafe wa which is the famous new york city cafe and so they did a one-off show at cafe wa like a very small room like you know nowhere close to what van halen's used to playing and alex brought along this little four-piece kit which is um if I were to guess, I'm wondering if it's pieces of the kit he had in 2004. Uh, but I'm, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure. But you can just see how small, you know, this is like probably the smallest kit you'll ever see him on. Um, yeah. It's even smaller than the you know the 1991 set, and and it was just a one-off show. And so he played this kit for this one-off show. But when they went on the 2012 tour, once again, John Douglas did his magic, and this is what they came up with for a kit. So they got this another behemoth of a kit with a big rack. It had this custom finish on it, which was much like, um, I don't know if they would call it, have to do with like um, car racing or motors or Alex is a big Porsche guy. And, you know, he's, yeah. he's, he's got a another son that um, looks just like him. And he's, he's younger, you know, his youngest son is really into car racing and does some real high-end car racing stuff. And so Alex has a big love of Porsche. And, Porsches and all that stuff. So I'm sure the kit, you know, has some flares to it that sort of, you know, resemble like auto racing to some degree. Beautiful kit. Kind of a, I don't want to say prism look, it but does. the finish, it, it, it has that kind of metal, like uh, it catches the light really yeah, well. Yeah. And you can see um, he's got like uh, gold hardware or copper hardware. I'm trying to think if it's gold or, or uh, you know, brass hardware, I guess it is. And, um, and then you can see where John basically like has like saw he has like a sixteen by twenty six and I think there's a um uh fourteen by twenty six like just attached at the front and you can kind of see where he attached it by using a um like a Ludwig mount. There's like your standard, you know, plain old regular, you know, Ludwig mount, and they um they just take a bar and they sort of connect the two drums together to hold it up. And um, yeah. and then he's flanked off the sides with I think they're um little sixteen by twenties on the side, I think that's what those are. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, it's a cool looking kit, and apparently that kit is now owned by David Frangioni by uh, Modern Drummer has it. There's, yeah, in the Hall of Fame yep. or whatever. I've seen kits like pictures and videos of that. And yeah, there's some videos cool. he just put out with a couple of um, Jay Weinberg. Yeah, Jay Weinberg, Mike yep. Portnoy. And you can see, like, later on, I don't know if there's a John Douglas thing, they made the outer kicks look like beer taps. So you can see, they, oh, they yeah. got, but they have all duels on them and stuff because Alex, you know, That's wasn't funny. wasn't yeah. drinking. And, and it just, you know, it just goes with the whole, you know, you get David the Roth back in the band. They're trying to recapture a little bit of that. This is the other thing I find funny, and I see this first in one of these ads for uh, Ludwig. So 
It says making history with Ludwig since 1974. So there are several times, and you'll see it in the next kit. And next next kit, where, where they claim, you know, they they list it. Alex with Ludwig since 1975, and then you know, like it's like he wasn't an official endorser until '83. But as we talked about way early on, he got his first Ludwig kit around 1970. So yeah, it's so like the numbers, the numbers the dates are, are like I don't understand where they coming up with nine. Nineteen seventy four is the year that Michael Anthony joined the band, but when they talk about seventy five to you know to twenty fifteen, like there's nothing significant from nineteen seventy five other than the fact that you know I think that's the year Alice got his first six and a half by fourteen super sensitive. Uh, so I, I'm just I wonder where they come up with these numbers sometimes. This next kit for twenty fifteen, it's the very last tour Van Halen ever did. It's another kit, very similar to the previous kit. Um, this one has like the, you know, Alex, like the chrome finish. And then he's got copper, copper hardware on this. And he's actually using a, uh, what at the time they were calling it a prototype. So it's a, a six and a half by 14, it's a regular superphonic snare drum, but apparently it had gotten used for quite a bit and the finish was sort of wearing off. So John Douglas took the snare drum, brought it back to his shop and used a metal grinder and grinded off the finish. And so mm. the snare drum eventually became the snare drum, which was the Alex's next, you know, next signature snare drum. So the other thing to note, which is kind of funny, it didn't happen all the time. You can see Alex is using like a DW hi-hat stand, but he's using uh, Ludwig Atlas pedals for the bass drum, but he's using a double pedal for the, for the bass drums. And some people have made comments about like, why the heck would, you know, and well, I, I have heard that it had some, sometimes it was easier for the sound man to only deal with miking one bass drum. But there are also shots. I get that. I've seen shots of him with the actual two bass drum pedals. So it probably depended, depended on which venue they were playing at. Yeah, I see both. And it's got that like hanging muffler above from the top that's um, coming yeah. down. What's the story with that? Is that just muffling? I'm sure it's or? just, you know, the 26s are big. I'm sure it's just, just to control some of the 26 a little bit. You can see he's yeah. playing the double pedal here again, but but he does actually play two pedals, so he will do that. And then, then he's yeah. got like um, you know, a bunch of like different water things on the side. Like they, uh, it, it's funny they call him Reverend Al. So um, he's because he's <laughs> yeah. an ordained minister. So like they have you know, the, it basically has like a, a little uh, uh, thing on his seat where it says you know, thou shall not sit. You know and yeah, the, the throne, throne of Reverend, Reverend Al. Al. And, and, and then he's got like, you know, his, they call it like salvation, his water off to the side. And, and you can see in this picture, he's got the two, two pedals on there. So it really depended on where he was playing, whether or not he used the double pedal or not. Hmm. And, um, whatever, same, no difference, I guess, of yeah. sound going out yeah, to the audience. 2002s, you know, mics above, um, but the thing to note on this kit is that when, uh, they put badges on this kit. They the badges were like Van Halen badges, like they basically had the VH logo on them, and then mm -hmm. they would um they would put like on it, it was really weird. It would say like seventy five to twenty fifteen. So again, I was kind of like, well, where are they getting this? You know, like there's a special key right here, seventy five yeah. to seventeen. You know, like which which again is weird because the tour ended in twenty fifteen, and like they never they never toured again. Like Alex. I mean, as far as, you know, I'm sure he's played a kit, but like there has never been any public pictures or, or audio recordings of Alex playing a kit past the last show they did at the Hollywood Bowl that I know of. And so I yeah. just, it, it's just weird where they're getting their numbers from sometimes. This is the snare drum. So this is an ad for the snare drum and it came with a special case, an AVH badge on it. The picture in the background, I believe, was taken by Alex's youngest son, Malcolm. Um, so he's, you know, both of the sons look like they're very adept at photography. The older son, Eric, I've seen some of his photos and he does fantastic job. Um, and this snare had to be expensive. And so, yeah. So I think at the time when those snares came out, they were probably between $2,000, $2,500. And now like, you know, you can't find them anywhere and people sell them online for six grand or, I mean, it's crazy. Jeez. And, uh, so there's a, you know, a couple of good shots of it. I think that's a P eighty six throw off on it, and yeah, it's a it's a cool snare. But John Douglas hand grind grinded off, you know, the shells in his workshop. So wow. it really started life cool. as a is a basically a well well used worn superphonic that that 
basically, uh, I think it was just one of those things where John was like, hey, screw it. Let's stick a grinder to it and see what that does. You know, like that sticks with the theme of Van Halen of like, eh, whatever. Yeah. It's just gear. Let's let's play with it. Yeah, there's this cool, yeah. cool badge. Um, Love it. Yeah. And so the last couple of things, like you'll see, like on some of the heads, they got Van Halen logos on the Remo heads. And then you'll see, um, yep. I got this shot from somewhere. It's probably somebody's stick collection. So I apologize to the person who actually owns all these, but there's a various, you know, bunch of sticks from the years. The thing with Regal Tip, I mean, I played them for years and I and I loved them, but but my hands are always dry, so I like a lacquer finish. And that's just, yeah, you know, too. so but but Alex's sticks is were unfinished. So like, you know, if you pick up a pair of his, I got them somewhere, and like they're really long and they're unfinished. Like it would be so uncomfortably and unbalanced for me to try and play those things. Like it's just weird. Yeah. And the last thing I will mention, and it's been talked about with John Douglas, and you know, he, and obviously people can get close, but there have been claims where people have always tried to get the Alex Van Halen snare sound. And John Douglas says, you know, people do this, people do that, but in the end, you have to be Alex Van Halen, you know. And that's his that's yeah. his quote. I mean, and it's true. I mean, yeah. you really kind of have to be Alex, but but there are people that have gotten super close to it and have gotten really really close. But I've seen Alex on a number of different snare drums and they it always sounds like Alex. It's, yeah. you know, that's bass. That's the Tony Williams thing too. It's like, they're searching for that Tony Williams symbol, the ride sound. And it's like, well, you're, you can get 99% or, or you can get 90% there, but you're not Tony Williams. Well, Same it, with Alex and his snares. And that's an excellent point you bring up too, because when it comes to like symbols, like I've heard, you know, you can have the same guy play the same ride symbol, but like, it's all in the touch. Like Tony Williams probably made the right ride symbol just come alive, you know, yeah. and it, it just, it's the way it is, you know, some people just, yeah, it is, but that's absolutely pretty much Alex. And again, thanks to Alex for all the years of inspiration. Sadly, yeah. Eddie passed away in October of 2020. And yeah. I don't think you'll ever going to see him out again. In my opinion, I would love to, but I just, you know, I mean, he, he did, he did his, he's done, he's done quite a service to the drum community. Very few drummers are as like beloved as Alex Van Halen. So I, I really, I'm, I'm sure people have enjoyed this. I would be curious per usual with these gear episodes. I think it's always cool that people share their stories like you did of seeing, um, Alex Van Halen, Van Halen in general live and just maybe what kit you saw live, what your experience was, how it sounded. Did you see two nights in a row like Kurt and one night was better than the other? Um, we really, I love reading that stuff. And I know Kurt would enjoy mm -hmm. hearing it in the comments as well. And and per usual, if there's anything we we missed, let yeah. us know. You know, Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, there's a lot of stuff to cover in these episodes. And and p people are more than welcome to comment and say, you know, hey, that's not right. He did. He had this or had that. Or, I mean, it's just, it's there's a lot. And, yeah, you know, and there are probably there, going to be is. people that actually have worked with him. I, I've, you know, as much as I love Alex and have, all these years, I've never met him. I've never walked, got, sat behind one of his sets. I mean, it's always been from a fan perspective from afar. Yeah, so, yeah, like go. for most people. But yeah, Kurt, I appreciate you giving so much time to the podcast. I mean, you've been on multiple episodes now. You're you're a veteran of the show. Um, Absolutely, and I'm sure we'll do something again down the road. But. uh so, so really, thank you very much to, first off, everyone for watching this. If you've gotten through both episodes no. per usual, leave a comment and let us know. Say, I watched the whole thing and I, you know, you enjoyed it. And again, leave comments about, you know, your favorite kits. But to you, Kurt, thank you very much for taking so much time. You've prepared hundreds of photos, which people have enjoyed looking at. Thank you very much for your time. Until the next time we do the next, uh, you know, whatever episode it is. But appreciate you taking your time and uh, spending it with me on this Saturday morning. So thank you, Kurt. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.